Okay, so we should be recording now. Um, all right, so this lab is a uh, more or less a chapter four lab. All right, so um, just kind of look, kind of look back. You know, where where are we in this class right now regarding this lab? Well, we're about to take an exam. That's you know, a chapter four exam and stuff. So, so remember chapters two and three. are kinematics. They're about kinematics. And again, what's kinematics? That's the study of bodies of motion without regard to why the motion or the reason for the motion. So without regard to the reason for the motion. And this is primarily the, uh, the work by Galileo Galilei in you know, one of our bonus questions. And it's not like Galileo wasn't interested in understanding why he just didn't know. So interesting you know, how things kind of work in history. The very year that many people refer to the father of modern science, Galileo, the very year that he passed away, 1642, was the very year that Sir Isaac Newton was born. And Sir Isaac Newton was born on Christmas Day, 1642. And Many people refer to him as the greatest, uh, the greatest mind of the human race. And uh, Newton, among many things, um, you know, he had a he had a prolific life, uh, but he brought out to humankind the very concept of laws of physics. Never before was this concept known to any human being. Isaac Newton was the first person to understand this. And so, and he did a lot of this in his, in the, and he was in his 20s. He was one of these, you know, great, great geniuses. Um, so Sir Isaac Newton wrote the Principia, I may have this year wrong. I believe it was in uh, 1660, I think 1665. It's one of the years, 65, 66, 67. I have to double check that. But in this book, Newton unveiled the three laws of motion. The law of universal gravitation well let's say and the law of universal gravitation for us right now so now Isaac Newton had an incredible uh, physical intuition so Newton was somebody who was gifted at working with his hands a lot he he made clocks when he was a kid that would run on flowing water. He, um, there's a story that there's a bridge in Cambridge University that Newton built without nails. His understanding of forces, the internal forces in wood and his, you know, his, his physical intuition was so great that he was able to build this, this uh, bridge that still stands today. He did not even require nails. So Newton, um, you know, so Newton was, uh, you know, if you heard my lectures, he he was uh, not a I would say a, a normal guy, I guess, if you will. He he um, you know he had he, with his great genius, you know, I guess came kind of a price, and he had a uh, you know major social flaws, um, you know, in um, you know he had uh, great fits of anger and rage. He uh, 
you know, he had a tremendous hatred for his mother. Um, his mother, I guess, uh, his father died before Newton was born and his mother left him to be raised by his grandmother. His mother, his mother and I guess the, the new husband uh, died and he, his mother came back to him at age 11. Newton never forgave her. So, so Newton had this whole thing where he, 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 did, he, he didn't want anything to do with women, period, for the rest of his life. So he actually was unmarried his entire life. So, you know, he, you know unusual guy. And so one of the things that he did is he did a lot of these studies that were in the Percipia and he kept them to himself. And his, one of his best friends, uh, Sir Edmund Halley, uh, you know, you remember him from Halley's Comet, he, uh, Newton shared these discoveries with Halley and Halley was just blown away. And Halley told Newton, you guys share this with the rest of the world. The world needs to know this. And so what Newton did is he basically for 18 straight months, all he did day and night, he hardly slept, hardly ate. All he did was work on this book and tremendous amount of uh, intensity and concentration that Newton had. And so, you know, that, and so this book came out and, and, and it's just, you know, he was just this phenomenal human being, right? That Newton wasn't. And so this really brings to humanity the concept of laws of physics. I mean, and, and, and what's beautiful about this is that other scientists who study other fields or interested in other fields could, could ask themselves the questions, well, if there's these laws that govern mechanics and gravity, might there be laws that govern other aspects of nature, like thermal physics or heat or, or electricity, magnetism? And the answer is yes. And in fact, the answer is that every single major theory of physics is governed by a fundamental set of laws. We wouldn't know anything about laws unless it was for Isaac Newton. So that's what brings us to this lab is, you know, let's, you know, as I talk about in the, um, in the uh, lectures, you know, Newton had three laws of motion. We're really going to, there's the one law that we use over and over again in mechanics is Newton's second law. So Newton's second law is a mathematical statement. His first law is about inertia. His second law is this mathematical statement. And his third law, you know, this, this second law defines force. And then the third law defines an interaction between forces, a force and a force and reaction force couple. But let's just kind of focus right now on what this lab is about. Newton's second law. Newton's second law states, it's a, again, as I, as I mentioned in, in the test review, it's about a system. Newton's law, Newton's second law deals with a system. So we define a system. Whatever that system is, could be a car with people in it, whatever. I have a system. And what Newton's second law says, now there may be external forces on this system. You know, um, F1, whatever reason. Maybe there's a force here, F2. Maybe some other force, F3. These are all external forces. I don't care about what's going on inside. I don't care if you know, there's two people in the backseat pulling on each other. I don't care about that. Those, if, my system, if my system is defined as, let's say, a car with people inside, well, what I care about are the external forces, like the force of friction on the tires, or gravity pulling all, all the bodies down, or the normal force pushing the car and all its occupants up, or the thrust. I don't care about people pulling on each other in the backseat of the car. That's, that's an internal force, right? So a Newton's second law basically says is if I take all of these forces, just like I was going in a vector's lab, and I just add them all up, sum of all external forces, and we may refer to that as a net force, if you will. I mean, add up all the, you add up a bunch of vectors, you get another vector called the net force. Again, sum of all external forces. I'll just use this. The right-hand side says that's equal to the mass of the system times its acceleration. Now, this may not seem like a big deal for, you know, the untrained eye, but I claim that this is nothing short of a miracle. What this tells you, this one equation tells you that all the work done by Galileo, this is Galileo on the right-hand side, you know, not with the exception of M. Galileo will tell you what A is. Gal I mean, basically, this is 
some body is accelerating. And if I know a body accelerates, I can use the, con the, the equations for constant acceleration. And I can tell you where the body's going to be, how fast is it going, and so on and so forth. See, it's all of this. The A is Galileo. A is kinematics. What Galileo did not know was this. This is the reason for, their, for anything to accelerate. You know, so M is called the mass, and it's actually really a measure of what's called the inertia. So this is a linear inertia, if you will. It is, this is the, the ten, inertia is a tendency of a body to continue doing what it's doing. All right, and so a body with more mass tends to have more inertia. I mean, if a boulder is coming at you, there's not much I can do to make that boulder uh, deviate. If it's coming at you, you just get out of the way. That boulder is going to definitely have a very high ability to continue doing what it's doing, and that's come at you. Whereas if it's a basketball coming at you, well, I could, I could deflect a basketball. Basketball doesn't have as much mass. The basketball doesn't have as much inertia. So mass times acceleration is the right-hand side. That's, this is what we call an inertial force. So right-hand side is what we refer to as the inertial force. The left-hand side is nothing more than just a vector sum of forces. That's it, just like you'd have in your vector's lab. So somehow, if, if, if a body has a net force on it and it has a mass, it will accelerate. And if I happen to notice that a body is accelerating and has a certain mass, that must mean that there must be a net force on it. So it goes both ways. This, is, uh, this does not have to be true. There's nothing that says that this has to be true. It just is, it's a, it's a law of the universe. And it is, it is uh, for whatever reason, it is, it is true. And it is one of the fundamental behaviors of the universe. And so again, there's nothing that says that this has to be true. This is a fundamental principle, fundamental law that has no more of a primary cause. It is a primary cause. It is one of the foundations of the theory of mechanics. <coughs> so, um, that's what this lab is about. All right, and so any questions about that? All right, so regarding this lab, um, let me, uh, I already fired it up, this lab. In the past, I had a little difficulty with uh, the software and how it interacts with Zoom. So let's see how I, I, I tried to, preload it this time around see if i have better luck all right so i'm going to uh share my screen okay all right so you should see the uh software now what did i do well i clicked on that link that's on the uh first page, top of the first page of the lab. And then I clicked on the play button and I loaded everything up because, you know, this, this thing takes forever to load up. All right. And so, I mean, that's what I, that's effectively what I did. Um, now the, um, and then there's these tabs on the top. I selected a one that said force graphs. All right. So that's more or less, um, you know, what, what's it now? Now, unfortunately, this lab is written such that, I mean, a lot of these labs, because of the COVID stuff going on, um, you know, the, there was one professor who had to write all the labs for both university physics and college physics. And so these labs are being done by the university physics people. And so the idea is he kind of wrote it such that, you know, it's more tailored for the university of physics people. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of like, well, I want you to figure things out for yourself in, 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 in this lab. And so, so how, how, what I kind of do is, is um, I, I, I think college physics, uh, I think things, things, things need to be more directed. 
So um, I'm going to kind of direct things a little bit more. Now you, you could do what you want, but this is kind of like what, what I would do. So I'll kind of direct you through this. So, all right. Um, the main thing about page one of the lab is there's this table on the bottom of it. And the idea is uh, in this table is you want to, you're, there's a, a particular force you're going to apply to some particular body that you choose. And you'll know that you can set the force, you can set the mass, we can calculate the acceleration. And then we can actually calculate the acceleration kinematically. All right, and so, so let's, let's kind of give you an example. So um, what I did is I, 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 I um, let's see, there's seven numbered uh, rows on this table. I did the first four rows for a mass of 100 kilograms. And I did the last three rows for a mass of 200 kilograms. So 100 kilograms is the selection of what's called the small crate. And 200 kilograms is the selection of the refrigerator. All right. So what I'm going to do is, is now this, this is not stated in this, in this lab. Um, I put this in here. But you want, I want to select uh, ice, no friction. I'm going, to, I'm going to eliminate friction in this particular, particular part of the lab. And what I'm going to do is I want to, again, I want to select a um, mass of 100 kilograms. So what that basically means is that if I go down to the bottom right, notice that it's set at file cabinet, which is 50 kilograms. Let's, uh, I mean, this is what I do. I, I, I select, um, here we go. I select the small crate, which is the top selection. The small crate, whoops, not the refrigerator. The small crate um, is 100 kilograms. All right, so it's a small wooden crate. You'll notice that. So you have a guy standing there with a small crate. Now, um, what we're gonna do is we want to, we want to try to, we want to try to figure out well, first of all, let's kind of calculate. I want to, what I want to do is actually set, I want to set, okay, this is, what, this is what I want to do. I want to set a force of 10 Newtons. So I'm going to take the applied force over to the far left and I'll change that number to 10. You notice that when I do that, the, um, the man, the man uh, now is in a position where he looks like he's about ready to push the crate. And we have an applied force of 10 newtons. All right. Now, I, so what I have now is a selected force and I have a selected, um, a selected mass. So let me uh, go back to my whiteboard briefly. So I'm going to try to look at the top row. And let me, let me kind of look at the top row and see how I want to fill it out. So, okay, so I have number one, row number one. Um, I have a force. I have a mass. See, the force is in terms of Newtons. All right, so again, row number one, I have a force in terms of Newtons. And I'm going to select 10 just like I did in that software. Um, the mass, as I said, I selected that small crate. So the mass is gonna be 100. Of course, the mass is in terms of kilograms in that table. Now, I want to actually calculate the acceleration from Newton's second law. Well, again, you know, Newton's second law says what in general, it says the sum of all external forces is mass times acceleration. Well, I can simplify this a little bit. First of all, I can, I can state here that we're looking at a one-dimensional system. I don't really need to worry about the vector hats. And the other thing too is I'm only applying one force. Remember, there's, no, there's ice on the ground, so there's no, there's no friction. So I only really have one applied force on the left-hand side, and it's gonna be mass times really a one-dimensional acceleration. So that generalized equation becomes very simple in one dimension. So how do I figure out the acceleration? I want the acceleration 
in meters per second squared. How do I figure it out? Well, I just, I just say the acceleration is simply F over M. Or, or what? It's going to be F is 10 Newtons. If I keep everything at SI, my answer should be at SI. So base SI, and the base SI unit for force is the Newton. The best base SI unit for the mass is the kilogram. So 10 newtons by 100 kilograms, simple math, we get 0 0.10 meters per second squared. And I might be able to go, so I'll, maybe I'll call it 0 0.100. So that's what I calculate. You know, you would show me maybe a sample calculation of how you get there. Now, that is theoretically what my acceleration should be. Now I'm going to continue. I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue on this uh, on this row. I mean, again, imagine that this row is continuing. I just I just don't have the whiteboard space. I mean, I really am going further to the right. I don't have any more space. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the kinematics and see if we can determine the acceleration that way. So your your next your next um, your next uh, column is going to be v sub i. Initial velocity, that's in meters per second. You'll, you'll have a final velocity in meters per second. And what you're gonna do, you're also gonna have a time. You're gonna figure out how, much, how, long, how long the uh, crate took to, to uh, slide over. And what you're gonna do then is you're gonna get the acceleration a different way. There's another acceleration and it's simply gonna be nothing more than V sub F minus V sub I divided by T. All right, and so we're gonna get it that way. So let's, so, so, so again, this is, this is really just row one of the table. All right, so the first three columns, you calculate theoretically. You calculate from, from Newton's second law. The last four columns you get from computing from what, what you observe in kinematics. All right, and so we're gonna kind of back up and see if the kinematics the, the behavior of the system agrees with what Newton's law predicts it to be. So let's go, let's go back and see how we do that. So let's go back to the, uh, share my screen again. All right, so what I'm gonna do, I should be ready to, I should be ready to go. I already set up, so I got, I got the guy ready to push the, push this, uh, this, uh, this crate. So I've selected the crate. I know the mass is 100, 100 kilograms. I can read that right off the system. Uh, let's see here. I selected ice. I don't want any kind of friction. And um, I also have a force of 10 newtons. So let's see what the kinematics tells me. So obviously the initial velocity, I can write that down right now, that's zero. I mean, the crate's not moving. So V sub I is zero. You didn't see me write it on the board, but I, I just wrote a zero on the board. Okay, so now let's, this is a little bit of a tedious lab. So I apologize, but uh, oh, one thing you need to do too is you need to see this little plus sign here on the velocity. You you click that and you and that opens up a velocity graph. And again, you have to say one Mississippi, two Mississippi a few times to have this thing open. There it is. <laughs> yeah, zoom kind of slows things down. All right. So now I have nothing on my graph, but you can you can see it's zero. Now notice one thing. There's a little uh, readout on the velocity right now on the far left, I'm kind of pointing out with my pointer. That right now says zero. You wanna keep your eye on that. And on the bottom of the velocity graph is the time duration. So what I would do is I would figure out what, it, I would pick out a special time, maybe 10 seconds and figure out what the velocity is at 10 seconds. All right, so at 10 seconds, you know, I mean, it could be nine seconds or, or, you know, or well, probably something you want to read off the table. It could be eight, could be 12, whatever it is that you want to do. But you look at that particular amount of time, you try to guesstimate, or you try to estimate as quickly as, or, or as close as you can. You wait for, you know, the velocity graph to hit the, uh, the location, uh, you know, uh, the time value that you want. Take a quick peek over at the velocity and that's your final velocity. And, and then time you read is your final time. So let me give you an example. So let me, I'm gonna hit the, uh, I'm gonna hit the uh, play button. You're gonna see this guy starting to push the uh, crate. Starts up very slowly. And I'm not really sure what you're seeing here because Zoom tends to uh, 
really slow things down. But you notice that the velocity is very slowly increasing. So the crates being moved very, very slowly. Nothing much going on. There is a very weak, you know, velocity graph starting, but I'm just gonna kind of wait around a little bit. And okay, so we're at 0 0.06 meters per second. Again, you know, he's not really, he's not really applying much of a force. So it takes a little bit longer. There's not gonna be much acceleration. I mean, we predict the acceleration should be like 0.1 meters per second squared. So we had to wait a little bit on this, but you know, you notice that it is accelerating. You, you start, you're starting to see the, uh, the crate move. Uh, we're just past about one, one and a half seconds right now. If you take a look at the velocity graph, um, I might wait around till six seconds, I guess, to kind of get myself a, uh, you know, you can kind of at least see, see the thing, but you don't, you don't have to, you don't have, actually have to wait for it to go crashing into the uh, brick wall, but it's still moving. It's at 0.16 meters per second. Um, all right, so it is about to, okay, right now it's at two seconds. So velocity graph is at two seconds, it's just, just barely past two seconds. So, and so we kind of continue on again, it's some experiments are tedious. I mean, when we increase the acceleration, or sorry, when we increase the force, we'll notice that the, that the, uh, that the, um, experiment goes faster. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, boiling water in your chemistry class, you know, or, you know, you just, sometimes you have to wait for the water to boil. So it's one of those things here. So we're at 0.25 meters per second. So we're just passing three seconds. So I'm, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of read it. At, so, you know, again, it's, um, this thing is, he's slowly in, increasing velocity. <clears throat> I'm just kind of, I'm allowing time to go by as so I kind of average things out. I don't want to, I want to let the software, you know, kind of be nice and, I mean, have the whole system be stable, not get a reading too early. So, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to wait for this, and I'm going to try to be very careful. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do it in about six seconds. All right, so continuing, yeah, and I think it, you do this by yourself, it's gonna be a little faster. I think I think the ticking of time on you know with the with Zoom as a competitor is source competitor is uh difficult here. Okay, I'm just passing four seconds. I want to wait till we get to six seconds and I'll read it. So so we're we have gone up to about 0.4 meters per second now. And I'm gonna I'm gonna get a reading right around the time it hits about six seconds. So give me a moment there doing this first one here for you. And then we'll, I'll do the second row, then I'll, I'll do one a little bit further down and then you could do the other ones yourself. So that's, you know, this is way, the kind of way it goes. It's uh, <clears throat> a little bit more exciting when you're meeting face-to-face. -face. I mean, the, the, the uh, Uniform Accelerated Motion Lab is pretty good and Newton's Laws Lab is actually very interesting. Well, you know, with the, what's done in, in the face-to-face -face, uh, lab all right we're a little bit past five seconds so i'm gonna i'm gonna look so i'm gonna look very carefully and make sure that we hit right at six seconds and i'll, I'll read the velocity real quick Let's see what we got all right so we're getting close now again you know you're gonna want to do this kind of stuff yourself but you notice the graph is slowly increasing and we're about let me try to see if I can hit it right on six seconds the best I can. And let's say about 0.58. Oh, sorry, 5.8. Okay. And I would say six seconds about now, 0 0.60 meters per second. All right. So let me uh let me stop that. So as I read this, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. So you go back here, what did I read? Well, I just read 0 0.60 at what? Six seconds. All right, I mean, that's, that's what I just got done reading. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if I already calculate this, that's gonna be, uh, let's see, final velocity 0 0.60 minus zero divided by six, that ends up being 0 0.100, um, 
and this is in meters per second squared. So again, you notice that there is very, I mean, excellent agreement. In fact, the very far right column um, is a percent difference. Now, you notice that on this table, you have, uh, it wants you to take two um, measurements and take the mean of them. You don't need to do that. Uh, just do one measurement. So, so what I want you to do is, you know, the force for the columns do the force column, you know, the, the mass column, the acceleration column, the first three, actually the first one, two, three, four, five, six columns. Skip this thing, this thing that says number two and the mean, skip that, but compute the acceleration. So that one, and then compute the, the percent, the, uh, the, um, the absolute difference, all right? And so basically do all the columns except the one couple that are under time taken. Do not, you don't have to worry about doing column that's labeled two or mean, okay? Just do one measurement, all right? So again, I'll, so again, this, this is what I want. So again, um, these are measured from Newton's second law. These are measured from the kinematics. All right, so let's do another one. I'll keep the mass the same. We'll increase the force. So again, uh, we'll do one more for you. So I'll share. All right. Um, typically, I think what I like to do is select the button that says reset all. That kind of just erases all the stuff I just got done doing uh, eventually. I think it. Okay, yeah. This thing is just very slow. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so now um, don't forget, okay, you wanna, okay. So ice is selected, continue with the small crate, that's fine. Um, now let's go and uh, let's now, okay, why is that happening? Um, okay, uh, all right, there we go. Wow, that, that was really, that really takes a while. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, okay, sorry about that. that. That was the computer software updating very slowly. All right, so again, reselect ice because I don't want any friction. Small crate should still be selected. It's 100 kilograms. And what we're going to do now is we're going to now, what I, what I want to do is select a force of 15 newtons as a second column. All right, so again, I'm on a second row. And I want to select the force of 15 newtons, but keep the mass the same. Now, again, what, what kind of, uh, if that's the case, what kind of, what, what should I be filling in? Well, what did I change? Well, let's see, this is row number two. And I, I changed this uh, 10 to a 15. The mass stays the same, it's still the crate. The acceleration's gonna be different. And of course, the initial velocity will be the same. So these are all gonna be different too. So let's see what, let's kind of look at Newton's second law and figure out, well, what should it be? Well, force equals mass times acceleration means acceleration is force over mass, or I have 15 Newtons divided by 100 kilograms, or I have basically 0 0.150 meters per second squared. All right, and so again, you know, that's, that's what I have now. That's what I expect. And so again, same, same kind of deal. Um, now let's, uh, let's look at the kinematics. Okay, again, this is just from Newton's second law, these first three columns, just like before. Uh, with the kinematics, let's go back to the software. And, and let's see, let me, I think I'm ready to set up here. So 0.15, I'll hit the 
I'll hit the. Um, Right, yeah, there's a there's a definite latency here. Okay, so he's ready to go. He's ready to push again. So now he's at 15 newtons. You see in the far left, uh, the mass is uh, is um, 100 kilograms. So I should see the I should see the the velocity increase faster. So maybe we'll try to take it at six seconds again. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kick this thing off. Oh, let me uh, open up the velocity plot again. So I hit the little plus button. It went away because I selected that reset all. So again, let's. Wait for this to happen here, velocity. And select the play button. And here's the you know, initial velocity is zero. You know, you'll start, you'll start seeing this uh, the velocity climb faster as you uh, uh, as you apply more and more force. And so I'm just going to take it at about, again, about six seconds. So again, it's kind of like watching uh, paint dry for a little bit here. But let's, um, and again, I'm looking at the velocity plot. And I'm starting to see it looks, looks like a flat line on there. But I mean, again, it's just going to get, you know, it's going to slowly increase. There's, you know, not much force being applied here. You know, I picked, I picked, you know, a, uh, relatively smaller force just because i mean if you if you pick up something that's going to go too fast and you won't be able to you won't be able to capture it you know it, it's not going to be something you but it'll be too fast for you to actually make an accurate uh measurement so i think it, it yeah the slow the slowness may seem a little boring but at least you know no matter how bad your reaction time may be uh you can still make an accurate measurement so <clears throat> so anyway let's uh let's do this then I'll kind of tell you what I want with the rest of the table. Right, we just passed two seconds. You notice that the bar in the um, in the velocity plot is, you know, it's, it looks like it's flatlined. It's actually increasing just ever so slightly. But I'll wait till it hits about six seconds again, and then we'll we'll stop and write write down the uh, values. <clears throat> and let's see here, we're getting close to four seconds. All right, we're, just, we're passing four seconds right now. So again, I'm going to take it to six seconds. All right, and so again, the velocity indicator on the left, I mean, we're already at 0.62. You know, remember last time we only got as far as 0.6 meters per second. So we've already, we've already surpassed the maximum velocity last time at four seconds. So, you know, and that's because we have a larger acceleration. All right, I'm about to pass five seconds now. <clears throat> and let's see what we have here. All right, let's start paying attention here. We're getting close to six seconds. All right, and... Very close. And let's see. Looks about right. I see 0 0.9. All right. So 0 0.9 meters per second at six seconds. I'll stop it. Let me uh, go to my whiteboard. <clears throat> well, let's see here. So I, I just, at six seconds, I wrote down 0 0.9, I saw 0 0.9 is over here squared. Well, let's see, well, what is that? Well, that's gonna be, that's gonna be, uh, let's see, the final velocity is 0 0.90, my initial velocity is zero divided by six. Again, that's gonna be uh, 0 0.150 meters per second squared. So again, we're agreeing, kinematics is agreeing with what Isaac Newton predicts, All right? So again, 
So those are the first two rows. Um, what I'd like you to do um, for rows, so again, everything's gonna be the same except the masses. So what I like, what I like for row one, let's just kind of talk about the force and the mass. Let's see what we're gonna, you know, what I what I what I would suggest you uh, put down. So, so here's the force. I'm just gonna focus on these two columns. Here's the mass. <coughs> And let's just kind of talk about this table. And, you know, so you have this table and row one, I just showed you 10 Newtons at hundred kilograms for the crate. And then we had all the other stuff we had to go do, blah, blah, blah. Uh, row two, I said, well, that's gonna be 15 Newtons and hundred kilogram of crate. Well, what I did in this lab is, is I did, let's see, we have row three through seven. Three, four, five, six, and seven. I selected the following. So I kept, uh, I had the first four remain. Try that. Just a little deeper. All right, so the first four. I say remain that wooden crate. And we'll go with 20 and 25 on the forces. So again, I did these two for you. You'll do the exact same thing again, and you'll stick 20 kilograms or 20, 20, sorry, 20 newtons for the force. You do the exact same thing I did before, but you'll put 25 newtons for the force. And then what I did, what I did is I select, I changed the map, the mass for the for the last three, I picked the refrigerator. And for the refrigerator, I picked, for me, I picked 15, 20, and 25. And again, all of this stuff is gonna have to be done, you know, I did these first two rows for you, but you'll need to do just like I did for the rest of these five rows. All right, and so again, you can select the refrigerator. Um, that's, you know, again, let me kind of show you that that is uh, one of your selectable items there. I've done everything with the crate, but you'll notice that down here, you also have the refrigerator and it shows up here. Hello. This thing is having a latency. Well, you have to believe me. <laughs> Here you go. Okay. Um, yeah. So there. So the refrigerator is one of your selectable items. And then when you select the refrigerator, you'll notice that the mass that corresponds to that refrigerator is 200 kilograms. And you'll notice that instead of uh, the crate there, you'll have the guy pushing a refrigerator. And you just, you know, and so you'll, you'll kind of do the same. You 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 go through the same process, right? So that's really the end of page one. Okay, any question about that? All right, uh, I'm on page two. <clears throat> now, page two, we invoke friction. All right, and so, um, so again, let me kind of remind you briefly how friction works again. Um, so <clears throat> friction, and when I say friction in this particular context, I'm referring to uh, I'm referring to surface friction. So friction comes in a couple of different forms. So essentially, <clears throat> you know, uh, one of the things that a person can do is let's say there's some sort of a crate or something and <clears throat> this person or somebody decides they're going to apply a force F onto, onto an object. Now, 
they can increasingly, they can increase the force, the applied force F on that object. But at first it will not move. It'll be a force of friction that will meet it. They'll be equal and opposite. So this will be the force of static friction. So static, in this case, we're talking about static friction. Static is a fancy word for saying not moving or, or not accelerating at least. Static friction. All right, so the more I push, the more friction opposes. So it's basically they're equal forces. So the, the, the force of static friction is gonna be equal and opposite the applied force. Until I reach a breaking point. At some point, a breaking point will be reached and the, the object will just begin to slide. And so that breaking point is called the force of the maximum force of static friction. So at some applied force F, um, we reach a breaking point. Where the box or the or the body just begins to move. Like I say just, just starts sliding. So this is the maximum force of static friction. All right. And we refer to that as F sub S max. So F sub S max, so redraw my picture here. S of S max happens to be equal to, this is an empirical formula. Okay, we don't have a way of deriving this. I, I can't give you, I, can't, I cannot tell you um, from first principles, from laws of physics, how you arrive at this formula. It is empirical, all right? So essentially, F sub S max is given by what's called the coefficient of static friction, mu sub S times the normal force. Okay, so this, this mu sub S, so again, N is, as I said in, in, the, uh, in the exam review, it's the force that the that the that the surface pushes against the body. It is actually a Newton's third law force. It is a force due to Newton's third law. It's an action reaction force. All right, and so it's the force that the that the surface pushes up on the on the body. So N is called the normal force. So we have F sub S max is a force, N is a force, which means that mu sub S is unitless. So mu sub S, again, mu, I mean, the physicists not only use all the capital letters and small letters of our alphabet, physicists have to actually borrow from other alphabets, like the Greek alphabet. So mu is a little letter M. So this is mu, like kind of like, you know, kitty cat says mu. This is a little m in Greek. And we say, we call this mu sub s. That's how you pronounce it, mu sub s. You know, sub in the subscript, mu sub s. Mu sub s is called, again, the coefficient of static friction.
It's what you refer to as an empirical quantity. Empirical means I learn about it through an experiment. So it is an empirical quantity. I cannot derive it from theory. Empirical quantity means I learn about it through experiments. I do not derive it from theory. Okay, so it is, you know, you set up an experiment. In fact, when we're meeting face to face, we would do this very experiment. It's an extremely low tech experiment. You know, you have an inclined plane, you have one body versus another body. I mean, what it is, it's, it's one type of, it's, you see a coefficient of friction, coefficient of friction for one type of certain, one type of body rubbing against another type of body. So I would have mu sub s, some sort of value, you know, let's say wood on wood, wood on glass. Uh, let's see here. Uh, various, you know, could be on, you know, uh, glass or wood on steel. So on and so forth. Whatever you can kind of imagine, that's one type of a material that would make a surface contact with another type of material, there is a mu sub s value that's been empirically determined. All right. And so, and it doesn't matter if it's wood, let's say wood on steel. It doesn't matter if let's say it's say it's a it's a wooden block uh, on top of a steel floor or steel surface or if a steel block on top of a wooden floor. It doesn't matter. It's just one body is in surface contact with another body. I mean, what really is going on here? Um, uh, if you look at it, I mean, again, it, we don't really understand this, but if you take a real close look at it, let's say a microscope, let's see it blow this up. What, is, what does this really look like? Well, one body, if you can look at this, is almost like feet. You know, one, and on the other side, you know, it, it's just, you know, just this, you know, some bodies are just different than another. And so what it, is, what it is, is these two are rubbing against each other. And it's just, you know, you know, just different kind of bodies are going are, are gonna to have a more resistance to movement than others. Uh, there's a relative, even though, even though the two bodies may look completely smooth to your, to your naked eye, um, the reality is, if you look closely enough, there is imperfections in the surface. That's really what it gets down to. That's why it's complicated. We don't really understand. It. All right. Now, once the body is moving, okay, so you push, 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 push. Finally, you reach that maximum force of static friction. Once the body is moving, then you become, then it goes to what's called kinetic friction. All right, so, so once the body moves, or begins to slide, once the body begins to slide, then it enters kinetic friction. Not static anymore, kinetic. Kinetic is a fancy word for moving. Like we'll talk about kinetic energy eventually. It's energy of motion, motion, kinetic. Now, kinetic friction is a little easier. But kinetic friction, essentially, you know, I have a body that's now moving. All right. And so let's say I have, you know, some sort of an applied force, capital F, just like before. Here I'll have a force of kinetic friction. We call it F sub K. All right, now kinetic friction, no matter how fast I'm pushing this box, the kinetic friction is going to be the same. Kinetic friction is always given by 
the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal. And so again, mu sub k is the coefficient of kinetic friction So it doesn't matter how fast the object is moving. The velocity does not come into play. As long as there's motion, whether well, it's 0.1 meters per second or 100 meters per second, it doesn't matter. No matter, as long as there's motion, there's going to be a kinetic friction given by mu sub k times the normal force. Now, let's remind ourselves of how you get the normal force. Again, again it is... In this particular case, in these simple flat surfaces, you know, if I look at Newton's second law, um, you know, in this, like in this case, you know, I, if I have a situation where the kinetic friction is always going to be the same, well, Newton's second law is going to tell me what? Well, I would do, again, I would do Newton's second law in the x direction. Sum of all forces in the x direction is going to be what? Well, I'm going to call to the right positive, to the left negative. And so um, I would say I have F to the right minus little F sub K to the left. And that's going to be mass times acceleration. All right. And so the only acceleration I would expect would be in the horizontal direction. All right. However, on the other hand, this is the normal force. The only other thing going on down here is the weight. So some of all forces in the Y direction. It's going to be the normal force up minus the weight straight down. And I do not expect any kind of acceleration through the floor. So that's going to be, a, that's going to be an acceleration of zero. So the normal force in these simple flat situations is going to be uh, equivalent in magnitude to the, to, to the weight. All right. So that's um, really what we're talking about here in the, for uh, the second part of this lab in part two is that, um, so part two, we look at part two, we start saying, okay, well, number one, we say without changing anything, you slowly build up an applied force until F sub A just overcomes F sub T, uh, F sub F. And what was the critical force when F sub A was just equal to F sub F? Sub F? All right. And so, that's um so let's take a look at that so um let's see here uh let me we're getting hit by a thunderstorm right now um all right let me go back to uh my go back to the uh lab until i lose power here um all right so what I want to do is I want to go to the, uh, I think, I think I'm good here. Um, let's, uh, what I want to do now is, is start employing friction. So I want to actually go and I'm going to go back to the small crate. I'm going to select the small crate and that hopefully goes fairly quickly. All right. I'm gonna get this uh, over with before the uh, this thunderstorm knocks out my power. Uh, yeah. All right, there we go, small crate. Well, that took a while. All right, so I'm gonna select the small crate. And now instead of ice, I'm gonna select wood. And I don't really care so much about the velocity any longer. We're not doing that any longer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna minimize the velocity plot. And what we want to do is we want to try to figure out, um, I kind of want to push the initial position back a little bit, allow this, allow this thing to have some, uh, some, uh, um, you know, some play, some, you know, some, some area to move. Now, now what we're going to do is we're gonna, we're, we want to select some of forces right there. We want to select some of forces. And that's going to show us the applied force and the frictional force. Now, I'm, I, I really have no idea. I'm doing this experiment. So I'm, I just have to kind of play around and say, well, let's, let's apply a force. I don't know. Uh, how about 100 newtons? All right, well, let's put, in, let's put 100 newtons in and see what happens. So I'll put in 100 newtons. 
Now I have friction now, it's no longer ice. So I have, you know, I'll, I'll click on the background here. Sorry, this guy is really gonna start pushing here. So I have hundred Newtons. And let me uh, select the uh, play button and see what happens. And I select the play button and nothing happens. What's going on here? Well, I'm in the static region, I'm in the static realm. And as a, I'm in a, and I'm applying, yeah, I might be applying a large force, but it's not enough to overcome. It's not the static, the cope, it's not the force of static friction. It's not big enough. All right. So again, what, what's happening is, well, it's, it's the applied force is being met by an equal and opposite frictional force. All right. Well, can you guys still hear me? Okay. in here all right good sometimes the electrical storms make zoom act funny so all right good all right um all right moving on so so i don't so i don't know yet let me let me try a larger force so again do an experiment i don't know 250 250 is that going to do it let's see 250 is really pushing now um Hit the play button, nothing. So I fooled around for a while, and I'll I'll try again. I when I, I already had the play button selected, so whenever I find that right right force, it'll it'll start moving. And so even if I try four fifty, four fifty is still we're gonna find out is still not enough. When I playing around, I noticed that. If I selected 500, then I'll get it to start moving, to barely start moving. Hit 500 and barely starts to move. So again, I played around enough to figure out that 500 Newtons is, is that special applied force that just gets to move. You notice it's going pretty much at, at at like zero zero velocity. I mean, and it might be actually 498 or something like that, but I mean, 500 Newtons is pretty close to it. So what did I just figure out by playing around with this? You know, I, again, I have friction. Well, if you look at it, again, I'm looking at number two on page, on page two. So what did I just figure out? Well, I'm in the static realm and I realized that I applied a force of 500 newtons. So again, going back to the static friction, I have a box that will not move. I apply a bigger and bigger force, it will not move. Being met by a larger and larger force. That's my applied force. Here's my frictional, uh, static friction force. Now, at some point I find out what force equals the maximum force of static friction? Oh, by the way, that force, maximum force of static friction is mu sub s times the normal. Or as I said earlier, it would be mu sub s times mg because the normal in this particular flat case is equal to the weight. So what did I just get done figuring out? Well, I know that the applied force that I, Played around with the find was 500 newtons. And the mass of the crate was 100 kilograms. And I want to understand what the, what the coefficient of static friction is. All right. So again, I want you to figure this out. You know, you're going to, I mean, you're going to want to solve for the coefficient of static friction, right? I want you to give me a number for that. Okay, so that's, well, you, you've now empirically determined, you know, what it, you know, you have everything you need. You, you, need. you, know, you know the mass, uh, you know gravity. Gravity is, you know, again, we've taken in this class to be 9.80 meters per second squared. And so I want you to give me, 
from this experiment, I want you to give me the coefficient of static friction. Remember, it, it is a unitless number. Okay. Now that's number two. Uh, now number three. It says, notice that as soon as the box begins to move in step one, it begins to accelerate. If the force is reduced, however, the velocity of the box can be held steady when F applied as F, uh, F sub S are equal. Find out what force is required to keep the box moving at a constant velocity. Again, what are you trying to do? Well, now, once the box is sliding, you've now gotten to a point where it's sliding. Now, you might have applied too much force. And so what you, but, but it doesn't really matter at this point. It's, once it's moving, it's no longer in the static realm. So now what's happening is, you know, in, uh, and oftentimes you'll find out that in general, mu sub s is generally greater than mu sub k, right? And so if you're looking at, you know, if you're reading a table of these coefficient of friction values, you'll notice that, you know, in general, you know, for some, you know, one type of a material rubbing in on, on another type of material, you notice that mu sub s is generally greater than mu sub k, which means that the force static friction is generally greater, the maximum force static friction is generally greater than the force of kinetic friction, which means that that force that you use to barely break the, um, you know, the, or to barely get that box moving, you continue applying that force, it's going to accelerate that box because the force of kinetic friction is smaller. So what, so what do you want to do? Well, you want to, re, you want to reduce the force now because S of K is going to be less. Now you have a velocity, right? You have a velocity now. And so you continue to apply a force, but now that you're in the kinetic realm, what happens now is that you have F sub K, which is generally less. And so what's Newton's second law gonna say? Well, generally speaking, Newton's second law in the X direction is gonna say, well, in some all force in the X direction, well, it's gonna be still be applied force to the right, positive, uh, the frictional, kinetic friction force to the left, and it's gonna be some mass times acceleration. If you want the, um, if, if you want to have this body, slide at a constant velocity, you're gonna to have to reduce that force down such that you balance out these two, the, you know, this force with the kinetic friction force and you get zero on the right. If you want a constant velocity, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to make the uh, applied force equal and opposite to the, the force of kinetic friction. And again, the force of kinetic friction is mu sub k times the normal, or in this particular case, the force of kinetic friction is mu sub k times mg. Well, how do we do that? Let's go back to the experiment and kind of play around again. So, <clears throat> so what, what did I do last time? Let's set this thing back up. So I had this uh, box and I'm going to stop it. I hit the wall already. All right. Um, I'm going to reset it to kind of way off to the left again. Now, as I said, you know, I, I was able to pick five. I'm going to get as far as over as I can to give myself some space. So what I'm going to notice here is that I will apply force of 500 Newtons again, and it's barely gonna get the thing going. But you'll notice that once it gets going, it's gonna start accelerating. So we're gonna find out that 500 Newtons is just about right to get it to slide in the first place. But it's, um, but if I can, but after I get it into the kinetic realm, it's gonna be too much. What's what you know that the because the force of static friction is actually generally greater. That's sorry, the maximum force of static friction is generally greater than the force of kinetic friction. So you're gonna notice this thing is gonna start accelerating. And so what I need to do is I want I don't want it to accelerate per se. And you know, and this 
graph that you see here, let's let's open up the acceleration graph, for instance. Acceleration graph, I, I really want the acceleration to be zero. And um, let's see here. And it should start, should start increasing. Yeah, there should be an acceleration that's non-zero. Uh, it looks like 2.06 meters second squared. So I actually, I, I actually want to fix that. So I don't want it to go off and accelerating into the brick wall. What I want to do is I want to try to, okay, now I have 500 newtons, still applying 500 newtons. It was, not, it was just enough to get me going before, but now I want to reduce this force down so that I, so that I get that acceleration down to zero. So, okay, 500 newtons, I, now it's too much force. So let's, uh, while this is going, um, let's take it to 400, see what happens. And if I take it to 400, the acceleration should go down. Okay, it's down to 1.06, I didn't quite do it. Okay, it's still accelerating, but not as much. So let's reduce it down a little further. Let's get down to about 300. See what happens. And if I do that, I notice the acceleration goes down to about 0 0.06. Okay, I've almost made it. So I found empirically that about 295 does the trick for me. So 295, again, that acceleration value should be pretty close to zero at this point. And what that means is it's going to it's going to accelerate at a constant. You know, that's pretty close to about 295. Means it's going to it's going to go at, at a constant velocity. So, <clears throat> so what's so what happened was it required 500 newtons of application application force to get the body out of the static realm to get it so it's it um, at the maximum source force static friction. But if I continue applying that same force, it's going to accelerate the block to the brick wall. I want to have the block not accelerate. Once it starts sliding, I want to reduce the applied force such that it's equal and opposite to the force of kinetic friction, such that those two forces balance out and I have, I have zero acceleration. And so empirically, I found that to be about 295 newtons. All right, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to problem four on page two? All right, well, what that means is that I want to know, you know, I want to, I'm going to try to figure out the, uh, the coefficient of kinetic friction. All right. So again, looking at this equation, um, what I'm saying here, let's kind of like go back to what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that in general, as soon as, you know, as soon as I got the box, the box moving, I had a situation like this, some of all forces in the X direction. Uh, was the applied force, let's say to the right, minus the force of kinetic friction equals the mass times acceleration. Well, I know the relationship between or the force of kinetic friction. So this really is the same as sum of all force in the X direction is uh, F minus mu sub K mg, the normal is equal to the weight in this black case, is ma. Okay, that's, that's the situation I was in is the moment the box began to slide. Now, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to reduce this application force such that it's equal and opposite to the, the, kinetic, the force of kinetic friction, such that what I get on the right-hand side then becomes zero. I wanna find out what that application force is. And then what, what can I do? Well, then I can say, oh, mu sub k, Mg is now that reduced application force. Maybe I'll call this F1 because it's the one that's been reduced. And I find out I can now determine the coefficient of kinetic friction, F1 over Mg. All right, and so, well, I did a lot for you, all right? I went and figured out that F1 empirically was 295 Newtons roughly. And again, we're using that wooden crate, so that's 100 kilograms. Gravity, gravitational acceleration, we're on the Earth, 9.80 meters per second squared. All right, 
So again, there you go. So I, I'd like you to tell me what the coefficient of kinetic friction is based upon these experimental results. I, I did the hard part for you. Again, the answer should be a unitless number. Again, this is what you do in the, in the actual lab we were meeting face-to-face, -face, right? So that's one through four. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give you a little break here. Uh, five and six and seven, you know, finishing page two, going to page three. Um, I'm gonna say we skip those. So five would be going to refrigerator and so on and so forth. I, I think you got the idea. So I would say in part two, you skip five, you skip six. That finishes page two. We're going to page three and you skip seven. Does that sound good? All right. And then um, the last part of this lab is part three is called queries. Queries um, is um, basically a set of physics questions in this case. So again, I, I think this is a good set of practice questions for chapter four, chapter five type stuff. So I, I would like you to do these, show all your work. Um, any questions about any of these queries? Do any of them look uh, particularly mysterious to you? You guys there? There should be uh, copious examples of like every kind of problem in my chapter four and chapter five lectures. I think chapter four lectures, yes. So I have elevator problems I talk about, um, I talk about weight, um, tension. You guys with me? All right, well, um, if you don't have any particular questions about the queries, then that's yeah. pretty much all I have then. You know, just maybe not an opportunity if any of the queries look mysterious to you. Uh, they all look fine. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah, certainly. Thank you for the Sarah, session. Are you, are you good? Yeah, I was just looking, looking it over. Okay.